Ma'am Ma'am Jen, pakai unmute po. Ma'am Jen. Ma'am Jen ah. Uh, excuse me Ma'am Jen. Ma'am Jen, if you can hear me. Ma'am Jen, na pakai unmute na microphone mo. Ah, Ma'am Jen. Excuse me. Paki unmute ng mic mo, unmute ng mic and then go back to the first ano. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Again, um, welcome everyone to the webinar number five program entitled Instructional Design for Open and Distance E Learning ODEL. My name is Jenna and I am your moderator for today's webinar. This event is brought to you by the Commission on Higher Education, Regional Office 11, and the University of Southeastern Philippines, a center of development in IT education. 
So this webinar is being attended through the Zoom application and also shown live at the Chad Regional Office 11 Facebook page. page. And this ser series of webinars organized by Chad Regional Office 11 will later be uploaded through YouTube. Just a reminder for our participants, Sir Rod, kindly show the uh, reminders, please. Okay, while waiting for Sir Rod, to show the reminders. Okay. Gentle reminders for everyone. Everyone is supposed to turn their uh, mics on mute. And then should you be later asking questions, kindly state your complete name. If you have to, if you have good internet connection on where you are located right now, you can also turn on your video, or if you have problems with connection, you can just turn it off. And uh, we would really want to hear from you and would like to include your voice in the conversation. So kindly ask questions and share your comments through, if you are using the Zoom, kindly um, access the chat box panel on the right side of your Zoom player or your hand. You may also comment on the comment section of the Facebook Live of the Chad Regional Office 11 um, page. So to formally start our program, may I ask Dr. Evelyn S. Eckle, Education Supervisor to Chad Regional Office 11 for the opening prayer. So let us uh, put ourselves in the presence of God. Our most gracious and loving Father, thank you, Lord, for once again allowing us to hold this webinar, O oh God. Thank you for the protection you have bestowed upon all of us. And thank you for the gift of life. Lord, this webinar is a part of our 26th Shed Anniversary Celebration. May you bless our God and guide our speaker, Dr. John Serrano, who will talk about instructional design for open and distance learning. May you continue, Lord, to be with us and bless also the participants as we listen to this. And we know, oh God, that this will be a great help in facing the new normal. Lord, we ask you and we lift to you the rest of this afternoon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For her welcome message, may I re um, I would like to call in the Director for of CHED Regional Office 11, Dr. Marika R. Casquejo, TESO 3. Hi, Ma Marika. Good afternoon, everyone. My acknowledgement to our distinguished resource person for this afternoon, no less than the Director of the Information Office of the University of the Philippines Open University, Dr. Joan B. Serrano. Thank you, Dr. Joan, for the gifts of your expertise and free service. My acknowledgement also to our partner in conducting these webinars yesterday, today, and to all our incoming webinars, the University of Southeastern Philippines, headed by President Lorde C. Generalau. USEP is one of the centers of development for ITE in this region. Let me also acknowledge Dr. Randy S. Gamboa, the Dean of Institute of Computing of USEP. 
we were able to have generous experts as our resource persons because of the assistance of Dr. Gamboa. My acknowledgement also to the CHEDRO 11 technical team headed by Dr. Luis D. Perez and the administrative team headed by Dr. Emma K. Bonsobre for supporting this initiative and for believing that our office need to do something no matter what the constraint is. And of course, to Engineer Rod Pangantihon, Education Supervisor of this office and the team for doing a great job in spearheading the conduct of our series of webinars. Thank you again, Pikari Brian, for the Zoom account. To all of you, whenever you are or watching, listening to Ched 11's fifth webinar, I hope you are always in the best of health. For those who cannot log in the Zoom because we have reached the 300 registered participants, we are live in Facebook and YouTube, and Chedro 11 is compiling the webinars conducted by our office for this to be accessible in our website as resources for our interested HEIs and faculty members. Your e-certificates will be emailed to the exact email ad you have specified in the feedback form, which can only be filled up within two hours after each webinar is conducted. This is our fifth webinar and we continue to look for ways in enhancing the conduct, making it more seamless and spontaneous so that our webinar will be more effective and useful. Today's webinar on instructional design for open and distance e-learning is our fifth and this is still part of CHEDRO 11's assistance in the retooling of the HEI's personnel and to our aspiration that as one region, we will learn together. Today's webinar is important because we will learn about the importance of instructional design in open and distance e-learning, the principles and processes of the instructional design. Various standards and frameworks are available for instructors and administrators to use when designing and implementing open and distance e-learning. Let us take this opportunity as the Director of the Information Office of the University of the Philippines Open University herself, Dr. Joanne Serrano is with us to further our understanding and learnings. As we continue to commemorate CHED's 26th founding anniversary, we find it necessary to conduct webinars on relevant topics that address the issues and concerns of our HEI personnel in this time of pandemic. Hashtag we learn as one. Our fourth webinar yesterday specifically allowed us to gain more insights on handling privacy issues. As CHEDRO 11 continues to serve its stakeholders and as we continue to live by our tagline, we find solutions. We are hoping for your useful support and cooperation to whatever initiative our, our office will do, especially in these trying times. We will keep you posted on our next webinar. While taking into account the safety of our personnel, students, and other stakeholders, and without compromising the quality of the learning experiences of the students and our commitments to academic excellence, together as one United Institutions of Higher Education in Region 11, we will cope and survive this pandemic. Thank you everyone for making yourselves once again available. Have a productive webinar and keep safe always. Thank you very much, Ma'am Maricar. So at this point, may I say, in these trying times, we are trying to be ready in every way we can possibly be. And what is the best, one of the best ways is for us to have the right person with the right abilities, in the right place, at the right time. Our resource person this afternoon is an associate professor of the Faculty of Management and Development Studies of the University of the Philippines Open University. She is the current director of the UPOU Information Office. 
She obtained her Bachelor of Science in Development Communication from the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. She also earned her Master of Management major in Development Management and Doctor of Philosophy major in Development Communication from the same university. Over the last two decades, she has authored a number of international and national scientific publications presented in various international and local conferences and served as resource speaker in various trainings, seminars, and fora in various areas such as open and distance e-learning, environmental advocacy, development communication, and educational technology and other related fields. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce to you Dr. Joanne B. Serrano. Good afternoon, everyone. So let me just share with you my slides. Okay, so I hope everyone is well, um, despite the current global health crisis that we are facing right now. Um, for many of us, or I don't know, uh, in Region 10, but here in Calabarzon, we have been in lockdown mode for um, almost three months. <laughs> and um, I know uh, even in your cases, you, had, you have had your share of webinars. So uh, in my experience, in my social media accounts and email, there have been uh, many push notifications on all kinds of webinars, video lectures, podcasts, and online learning and other topics related to it. Um, today, uh, let me share with you about, um, from the perspective of the University of the Philippines Open University, um, in terms of instructional design for open and distance e-learning or ODEL. Uh, due to the threat of COVID-19, academic institutions are facing decisions about how to continue teaching and learning while keeping their faculty, staff, researchers, and students safe from this global public health crisis. There have been many discussions on the modality of learning and other issues and concerns on how to proceed with the delivery of instruction this coming school year 2020-21. So this uh, webinar series being organized by CHED Region 10 and USEP is actually um, one of these um, interventions. So in today's talk, um, I will be discussing three uh, main points. Um, uh, I'll talk about what is instructional design. Um, and its importance, as well as the principles of instructional design and the process of instructional design. So as Tony Bates said, Tony Bates is one of the e-learning experts uh, and he has been in the field for many decades. And he said, it is not a good idea just to jump into it and hope to wing it. Teaching online is not rocket science, but it does need a different approach from classroom teaching. So converting your face-to-face -face lectures to online lectures may not cut it and may not deliver the same result in terms of achieving the learning outcomes and providing a deep and meaningful learning experience to your students. Hence, it is important to look at your course design before you, even began, uh, before you even begin to think of delivering your courses online or using other instructional delivery mode or method. With the advances in technology and, devel and developments in the 21st century uh, pedagogy, there has been a blurring in the role of a teacher and instructional designer. So in the past, teachers just had one role, and that's to give lectures and teach students. However, in recent years, teachers are also expected to be competent in instructional design. So this is especially true in these um, times that we are suddenly uh, 
pressured to transition to a, dif a different uh, modality. So let us first define uh, what instructional design is. Wait, let me just uh, change my, all right. Okay. So uh, let us uh, first define what instructional design is. Wait, uh, <laughs> I'll just change my um, view. All right. Okay. So when we talk of um, instructional design, um, it is a systematic approach by which e-learning materials are designed, developed, and delivered. So the key term here is it's systematic. So it's, uh, it refers to a systematic development of instructional specifications using learning and instructional theory to ensure the quality of instruction. So there are specific um, theories that are used in designing instruction. Instructional design is the entire process of analysis of learning needs and goals and the development of a delivery system to meet those needs. So it includes development of instructional materials and activities um, as, in, as well as trying it out or implementing it and evaluating it, um, including all the instruction and learner activities. So uh, instructional design facilitates learning by identifying the purposes of the learning, uh, especially the learning objectives or learning outcomes. And um, it helps develop the learning experiences necessary to achieve those pur purposes. So um, instructional design uh, is also, uh, also helps in evaluating the effectiveness of those learning experiences in achieving the uh, main purpose as well as improving the learning experiences in the light of evaluation so as to better achieve the purposes. Okay. So as stated earlier, uh, nowadays there is a blurring uh, between the role of instructional designer and a teacher. Um, in the past, it's very clear. Um, I remember uh, during the start of the UP Open University, we had an entire office specifically um, uh, uh, set up or established just to focus instructional design. And then once it's delivered, another office would deliver it. Once it's developed, another office would deliver it. But nowadays, um, because of the advances in technology, there has, be, there has been the blurring of a role between the instructional design and the teacher. Um, it is often assumed that teachers are not just knowledgeable, but also experts in instructional design nowadays. So um, as a teacher, you're expected to plan, create, and deliver educational or training materials for your institutions or other organizations or for other purposes. So you're not just expected anymore to just um, do a lecture, but you're actually expected to design an instruction. So we might be asking ourselves, what is the big fuss about instructional design? Um, according to the Commonwealth of Learning, the best way to explain this is by describing the major differences between teaching in traditional face-to-face -face setting and teaching via online or uh, in distance learning environment. So in a conventional um, or traditional face-to-face -face, uh, setting, Teachers have the ability to decide which methods are needed to use and vary the methods and strategies depending upon the learner needs. So as teachers, um, we all know this, that uh, even the day or the night before, you can just suddenly revise your lesson plan, or even if you have not prepared your lesson plan, you have the ability to decide which particular lesson you would deliver during the day. And uh, you have the liberty to change it whenever you want it. But in online and distance learning setting, pre-planning is quite essential. 
it's actually crucial and critical. So how to teach becomes crucial to the success of the entire system. And in this particular scenario, learning materials are prepared in advance. So you cannot just um, wing it and just prepare your material during the day or just the night before your um, meeting or, if, if, or, or the learning session. So there is a media to support those, uh, the media to support those materials are pre-selected and um, changes to materials cannot just be done um, in the middle of uh, uh, the session. So um, before we proceed, let me just put in context my discussion and instructional design by sharing with you the um, worldview uh, of the University of the Philippines Open University, which is the open and distance e-learning. So open distance and e-learning or ODEL is a worldview that combines the philosophy of open learning, the pedagogies of distance education, and the technologies of e-learning. Um, I remember one colleague from the e-learning uh, sector once asked me, isn't distance education the same as e-learning? So how, how come UPOU separates these two com concepts? So let me discuss that further. So as I've said, ODEL is a worldview that surfaces the convergence and integration of all these three concepts. So open learning, the concept of open learning, which is actually grounded in the philosophy of openness and inclusion, distance education and its concept of learner-centeredness and flexibility, and e-learning with its connectivity and constructivist framework. And the convergence and interweaving of these three domains infused with the values that underpin the universitas, which are excellence, academic freedom, humanism, um, intellectual pluralism, democracy, and service society will pave the way for social transformation. So this is the framework that the UPOU is um, basing its, uh, not, just its course, uh, not just its instruction, but as well as its research and uh, public service. Now, one important characteristics of ODEL is that it maximizes the affordances of technology. So let me share with you this useful framework for understanding what it takes to teach effectively using technology. Um, because that's what you will be doing. Even if you will not be um, doing it purely online, even if you will be using a different modality or a blended or a combination of various modalities, um, essentially, technology will play a very crucial role uh, in your um, instructional delivery in the coming months. So it's important to look at how, the, how these various components um, interact or the interplay of these va uh, various dynamic components. So uh, this is a useful framework uh, for understanding what it takes to teach effectively using technology. So we call it the, um, some call it TPAC, some call it TPCK. It was actually proposed by Mishra and Kohler in 2006. So this is a use, uh, useful framework for understanding what it takes to teach effectively using technology since online distance learning relies heavily on the use of technology. Even before the disruption in education brought about by the COVID pandemic, teachers often treat technology as if it is separate from teaching and learning. And I'm sure you have attended many workshops on how to teach effectively, but did not include discussion on what, on what technology and tools to use in the learning activities. And likewise, there are, uh, I'm sure you have also attended workshops and trainings conducted on the use of some specific software or app, but how this technology fits in your teaching and learning approach has not been discussed. So um, Mishra and Kohler pointed out uh, that the separation of discussion of pedagogy and technology actually leads to various problems. So let me uh, summarize it into four problems. 
or issues. Uh, first is that the rapid changes in technology may make it extremely difficult to keep up with all the latest advancements and apps. And I'm telling you every day, hundreds or probably um, in this time of pandemic, because we are heavily reliant on technology, there are probably thousands of apps which are being developed. Uh, and the advances in technology lead to the development uh, of technology that contributes to the rapid doubling of human knowledge. So um, if you will look at the literature and some futurist experts are estimating that in 2020, human knowledge doubles every 12 hours. So every 12 hours, additional knowledge is being added. So you can imagine how much knowledge is available nowadays. Number two is that softwares and apps are mainly designed for business, not really education. So you probably have attended a number of webinars um, organized by various publishers. And these are for free, given for free. But you know, this is not actually free because those um, technology, softwares and apps and business solutions, all the learning management systems that they have been um, sharing with you for free, have actually been designed for business purposes. So um, eventually, the bottom line is how they will earn money from all these um, softwares that they are sharing with you. Because eventually, you would be buying uh, the um, platform or even the content from them. So this means that students are learning how to use the program or tools and not, le uh, not really learning the content of the class. So, for example, um, your school decided to um, use a particular learning management system uh, because of its various advantages over the others. Remember that uh, when you do this, um, students are actually learning basically how to use the functionalities or the programs or tools in that particular LMS. Um, more often than not, the content has have just been populated in that LMS, and they have not really been uh, been designed to work, or have not been uh, in, have not been designed in a way that are that each uh, con each comp uh, component are interwoven or uh, plays a dynamic interaction with each other. Number three is that the situational nature of the class. Um, wherein a teacher can adjust a lesson to make sure it meets the needs of the specific group of students. But the technology cannot do this. So although there are new adaptive, techno adaptive technology, it still cannot replace the judgment of a teacher. And number four, the emphasis is on what and not how. This means that the lesson becomes about what technology are we going to use, what does it say, what skills that it require instead of how can I teach my students? So the framework um, highlights the dynamic interplay between and among the various components of teacher, uh, teacher knowledge in terms of technology, pedagogy, and content. Um, in this framework, there are three primary forms of knowledge. So we have the content knowledge, uh, if we will look at the blue um, circle, and then we have the pedagogical, pedagogical knowledge, which is, which is the yellow circle. And then we have the technological knowledge, uh, which is the, uh, is it a pink one or a lavender? Um, and the center of the diagram, uh, which is known as the TC, TPCK, represents a full understanding of how to teach with technology. So this framework was developed to explain this, uh, the set of knowledge that teachers need to teach their students a subject, uh, teach effectively, uh, teach their students a subject or the content, teach effectively or the pedagogy and the use of technology. So keep in mind that this is not the same as having knowledge of each of the three primary concepts individually. So, uh, it is given that as a teacher, you should have individual knowledge of these concepts. But aside from understanding each component individually, uh, for example, you have content knowledge, you have pedagogical, no pedagogical knowledge, you have technological knowledge, it is also important to look at these components in pairs. So we have um, 
pedagogical content knowledge, we have technological content knowledge, and we have techno technological pedagogical knowledge. And all three taken together, or the technological pedagogical content knowledge. Now, the point of TPCK is to understand how to use technology to teach concepts in a way that enhances student learning experiences. So it's not about the technology per se, but the dynamic interplay of these three components. Um, so they're in equal, uh, equal footing, and it's important that you look at the dynamic interaction of these three components. Now, uh, let us look at them one by one, because um, this is very important when you are designing your instruction. Um, you have to know what are the various components that you should bear in mind. So, of course, you have pedagogical knowledge, or PK, which uh, describes teachers' deep knowledge of the practices, processes, and methods regarding teaching and learning. So, um, you sh it is given that as a teacher, you should know how to teach online and how to teach face-to-face -face are very different. So this is the pedagogical knowledge. You should know how to teach certain concepts uh, depending on what type of modality you will be using. It is a generic form of knowledge. As a generic form of knowledge, uh, PK encom encompasses the purposes, values, and aims of education and may apply to more specific areas, including the understanding of student learning styles, classroom management skills, lesson planning, and assessments. Um, and then we have technological knowledge. Technological knowledge uh, describes the teacher's knowledge of an ability to use various technologies, technological tools, and associated resources. A little later, we'll be talking about various learning resources, which are very important uh, in uh, designing your um, instructional material or method. And then um, this particular knowledge includes skills on how to use or operate certain technology. So um, remember, uh, technology now plays a very important role in the way you teach. So uh, you cannot just say, oh, I will, I will let my students operate a certain tool or technology because you will not be seeing them face to face anymore all the time. So as a teacher, you should have Techno technological knowledge and how to use certain apps or softwares or other technology even if we, if they are not online because it is one of the, one of the expectations from you another um, is the content knowledge uh, which describes teachers on knowledge of the subject matter so it may include knowledge of concepts theories evidence and organizational frameworks within a particular subject matter it may also include the field's best practices and established approaches to communicating this information to students. Um, this will, uh, of course, differ according to discipline, uh, discipline and level. For example, um, senior high school science and history uh, classes require less detail and scope than undergraduate or graduate courses. And then we have the pedagogical content knowledge, which is a concept actually proposed by Schumann, Schumann in 1986 and which inspired the TPCK model. It has to do with a teacher's knowledge on how his or her subject matter should be taught. It focuses on promoting learning and on tracing the links among pedagogy and its supportive practices. So PCK is concerned with the representation and formulation of concepts, pedagogical techniques, knowledge of what makes concepts difficult or easy to learn, knowledge of students' prior uh, knowledge or learning, and theories of epistemology. It also involves knowledge of teaching strategies that incorporate appropriate conceptual representations in order to address learner difficulties uh, as well as uh, misconceptions and foster meaningful uh, understanding. So that's pedagogical content knowledge. And then, of course, we have the combination of technological content knowledge, or TCK, which, which refers to knowledge of how to use, uh, how, 
how the use of technology impacts on the subject matter, including how it is represented, organized, and learned. So it involves understanding how the subject matter can be taught through the use of appropriate technology best suited for a specific subject matter. So um, this is where questions uh, come in like, how do I teach um, a particular subject matter? How do I teach condensation if it's online? How do I conduct uh, lab uh, laboratories if it's online? So um, you as a teacher, uh, you should have this technological content knowledge um, because uh, this will make or break whether you will be able to achieve the learning outcomes. So it is important that teachers know not just the subject matter, but of course, uh, the manner in which the subject matter can be changed by the application of technology. And then we have the technological pedagogical knowledge, uh, which refers to knowing what technology to use for a particular teaching task, knowing how to use a particular technological tool to achieve a particular learning outcome or set of outcomes, and knowing what pedagogical strategies are appropriate and effective and using technologies according to these strategies. And then of course, uh, the combination of this uh, various components which is the TPCK and according to Mishra and Kohler, TPCK requires an understanding of the representation of concepts using technologies, pedagogical techniques that use technologies in constructive ways to teach content, knowledge of what makes concepts uh, difficult or easy to learn and how technology can help redress some of the problems that students face. Um, knowledge of students' prior knowledge and theories of epistemology and knowledge of how technologies can be used to build on existing knowledge and to develop new epistemologies or strengthen old ones. Okay, so in order for you as teachers to make effective use of this framework, you should be able, uh, you should be open to certain key ideas. So number one is that concepts from the content being taught uh, being taught can be represented using technology. Number two, um, pedagogical techniques can communicate content in different ways using technology. And three, different content, uh, content concepts require skills, uh, skill levels from students and technology can help address some of these requirements. And uh, students come into the classroom with different backgrounds, including prior educational experience and exposure to technology. And lessons utilizing uh, technology should account for this possibility. And number five, uh, technology can be used in tandem with students' existing knowledge, helping them either to strengthen prior epistemologies or develop new ones. Okay. So I know um, there, that's a lot to take in, but uh, just breathe in for a while. Anyway, this um, video will be shared later and you can just go back to this and try to, um, try to digest and reflect on these various components because these are very important components that should be taken into consideration when you are now designing your instruction. Okay, so not le now let us go to the principles of instructional design. So in this talk, I will not really um, talk to you about um, basics of layout because those are actually um, something that you can learn from the internet. You can uh, find some template or you can watch some uh, videos on how to probably lay out or design a script or do some storyboarding. But let us focus on the principle because this is the uh, most important concept. You should know the principle of instructional design in order for you to uh, effectively and uh, properly, appropriately uh, create your own um, instructional material, um, be it an online material, be it for a distance learning type of material, be it for a, just for a remote teaching type of material. Um, the basic premise is that you should know the principle so that you can actually design it yourself. 
Okay. So, um, according to Bietham, uh, um, there are actually four principles that you should bear in mind when you are designing uh, an instructional material or content, especially if you are integrating technology in your design. So number one is that you should design for learning outcomes. Number two is you should design for learners. Number three, you should design with digital resources and technologies. And number four, you should design for dialogue or interaction with others. Okay, so I try to digest all those uh, principles first. Okay, so let's uh, run through them one by one. So when designing um, instructional content or material, for open and distance e-learning. It is important that you are designing for learning outcomes. So when we talk of learning outcome, these are some identifiable change that is anticipated in the learner and some specific skills, uh, attitude or, or per perspectives or capability. So, um, I will not go into the details of learning outcomes because I know that CHED has been, um, and I'm sure your institution has been giving you a number of workshops and training on developing um, outcome-based education. Uh, so I'm sure you are all experts now in terms of developing learning outcomes, but uh, bear in mind that this is one of the basic principle of instructional design. You are designing for learning outcomes. So um, in this principle, you must consider the following. So what is the overall purpose of the learning? Is the purpose clearly defined and shared with the learners? So um, it, it's not enough that you are, you are able to craft perfectly crafted or designed learning outcomes. It is important that you have clearly shared these outcomes with the learners. Um, and you should ask yourself, is there room for some negotiation or variation of purpose? And if so, how does this discussion take place? And uh, you should also ask, what is the main content? Is, is it fact? Is it theory, data, or processes that needs to be covered on this course? Or what are the main skills that learners will need to develop on this course? What are the ways in which they can develop or practice these skills? Okay. And then um, you should also ask, so I'm, I'm running through this. You can consider this some sort of a checklist. Um, so, another point is that what new knowledge or skills, capabilities, and or attitudes will learners gain? Are these uh, made explicit as learning outcomes, including digital capabilities? How will learners know when they have achieved the outcomes and how well they are doing? What different kinds of feedbacks are available? How will learners be assessed, if at all? Are the assessment criteria clear and relevant? How could the learning process be captured, example, using digital services, to support reflection, review, sharing, and feedback? And uh, now we go to the second uh, principle, uh, which is designing for learners. So in the design for learners, uh, instructional design must address issues of access and inclusion, taking into account the diversity of learners in terms of their experiences, approaches, and support requirements. So remember that uh, aside from the learning outcomes, you are now designing for your own learners and they, are, they have diverse characteristics. So, Again, some of the checklists that you can um, ask yourselves, are the outcomes appropriate for these learners? 
Okay, so you have designed, uh, uh, you have crafted the learning outcomes and uh, you feel that they are appropriate for a particular subject. But now you have to ask yourself, are the outcomes appropriate for these learners and for all the learners? How could different challenges be introduced? Um, do learners have choices of how they carry out a task? For example, about the tools they use, the media, the media they reference, other people they participate with. Um, are learners' differences valued? Example, by setting collaborative tasks, by rewarding innovation, as well as accuracy. How are support and feedback adapted to individual learner need, learners' needs? Um, are there opportunities to work individually and collaboratively during the activity? How are learners involved in the design process? Remember, um, one of the premise in open and distance e-learning is its learner-centeredness. Um, for example, students are able to negotiate over outcomes, tools, and assess tasks. How will you address differences in learners' digital confidence, capability, and access to digital resources? Where can you signpost them for further support or for further um, uh, challenge? Uh, and then another, the third principle uh, in, in instructional design is uh, you are designing uh, with digital resource, uh, with digital resources and technologies in mind. Um, UNESCO has uh, in 2011, has been, or um, maybe even earlier than that, has been espousing um, and promoting and advocating for the use of open educational resources, which is why uh, in designing instruct in the principle of instructional design, one of the principle is that you design with digital resources and technologies in mind. Um, but it doesn't mean that you will disadvantage um, those students who do not have access to digital resources and technologies as well. So. Uh, in choosing tools and resources, it is important to consider their affordances. Uh, what the tools and resources are good for relative to the desired learning outcomes, uh, which are a function of the subject matter and educational level, as well as learner capabilities. Um, what resources will learners have access to? So this is what I've been uh, saying earlier, that um, even though you are designing uh, with digital resources, you should uh, take into consideration if your learners have access to internet connectivity. If not, how will you um, make these learning resources in digital format available to your students? Um, what resources do you expect them to, to access for themselves? And have you ensured that all the resources you provide are accessible? And um, you should also ask what information, media, and data literacies will learners require to access and use these resources? Do they have the um, digital literacy uh, in order to search uh, and access the uh, materials that you have uh, pre-selected for your course? And how will this be supported and developed? And how do you expect learners to manage, share, and make use of digital resources? Is this explicit? You should be able, so you should have specific instruction on what to do with those resources. And then um, what devices and services, example, mobile or web-based, will learners have available for use? Uh, what devices and services of their own could they use? And how will you address issues? Um, how will you address issues of differential access uh, to devices and services uh, if this is relevant? And how will you use learners' digital access and know-how as a collective resource, example, through group work or informal mentoring? And what support will you and your learners need, example, IT support, specialist librarian, and other uh, professional service to make best use of these technologies? And number four, uh, the fourth uh, principle of instructional design 
is that you are designing for dialogue or interaction with others. So you should consider this uh, following checklist or principle. So what is the role of the teacher in this activity or subject? How will teacher-learner communication be initiated? How will learners interact with one another? What are the opportunities for peer learning and collaboration? Are opportunities to other people into the learning situation, example, public audience, experts, fellow learners, or elsewhere? And how are the dialogues structured? Um, how are the dialogues uh, structured, guided, and supported? How are the rules of academic or professional communication made clear? And um, how can computer-supported communication, example, video, discussion forums, social media, and public blogs, be used to support dialogue or interaction? And who will give feedback to learners on their progress, and how will this be communicated? Have you considered how digital technologies could be used to support peer assessment and review? Okay. So uh, to discuss further on designing for interaction, uh, so if you will review uh, the four um, uh, principles in instructional design, we have designing for learning outcome, designing for learners, designing for digital resources, and the fourth is de uh, designing for uh, interaction. So, um, to discuss further on designing for interaction, um, let us discuss the different forms of interaction in online and distance learning. So most, most of the time, people would have this misconception that when it's online and it's delivered via distance, that there are no interactions anymore. Um, so it, yeah, they would pro sometimes say that the interaction uh, is actually gone or there's no um, interactivity anymore. But that is not true. So if we look at this framework um, designed by Anderson, he emphasized that interaction has always been valued in distance learning, even in its most traditional or independent study format. Um, Lori Lord constructs a conversational model of learning in which interaction between students and teachers played the critical role. And Bates said, interactivity should be the primary criteria for selecting media for educational delivery. So if you look at this figure, you would see the various interaction that occurs in open and distance e-learning. Learning. So you have the learner-learner interaction. You have the learner-teacher interaction. You have the teacher-teacher interaction. You have the teacher-content interaction content content interaction in the learner content interaction so um, when you talk of learner content interact uh, learner learner content interaction um, a learner interacts with content by undertaking a learner a learning task independently or by him or herself Examples of this type of learning activity are um, answering self-assessment questions, reflecting on an assigned reading, taking a quiz where feedback is automated, um, as in online quizzes. You, I think you have already discussed about the learning management system. So there's a functionality there wherein you can set up a quiz and then you can have it um, automated so that students would have an automatic feedback on uh, the result of the quiz. So that's one type of learner content interaction. Uh, these activities allow students <clears throat> to ascertain their understanding on the con of the content and immediately apply it to their immediate context. Uh, and then you have the learner-teacher interaction. Um, there, there are also learning activities where the learner relies on a teacher for feedback. So written tests, oral examinations, um, tutor mark assignments are examples of this type of activity. So the feedback provided by the teacher in these activities help learners to learn more effectively, improves their motivational state, clarifies their understanding of the content, and facilitates their progress in the course. So uh, learner-teacher interaction refers to all communication between the teacher and the learner, 
that occurs throughout the course. So it can be asynchronous, uh, such as in the case if you have a learning management system and you put up a discussion forum there, and then where you ask your student to answer certain um, questions and then you ask them to into one another by each other. Uh, and there's also the one. You can probably do an online lecture uh, or you can have an, a face-to-face -face consultation, uh, sorry, an uh, online consultation. Um, so all these kinds of communication, be it in text, audio, video, and other forms of communication media, uh, refers to that interaction between the learner and the teacher. Um, however, um, you should be warned that the facility of such communication leads many new teachers, especially those who, have, who do not have um, uh, experience in doing a blended or an online type of learning uh, teaching. Uh, teachers sometimes be, be, uh, they sometimes feel overwhelmed by the quantity of student communications and the rise in students' expectations for immediate responses. So you should draw the line. This should be very clear in your uh, course guide or um, in the rubric on when, how, and uh, uh, what will be the manner of your response to your, uh, to your students, okay? And then there's the learner-learner interaction. So this is very important because uh, there is that misconception that in online and distance e-learning, there are no interactions that happen anymore among the students. But again, that is not true. Uh, this type of interaction is both cognitive and social in nature and refers to communication between and among peers with or without the teacher present. So, uh, they can actually interact with one another even if you are not there. So the interaction can be one to many or class-based. It also allows learners to discover different ways of thinking about solving problems, allow pluralism, and increases the completion rate and the acquisition of critical social skills in education. Um, according to Anderson, modern constructivist and connectivist theories uh, theorists emphasize the value of peer-to-peer -peer interaction in investigating developing multiple perspectives. Uh, this type of interaction includes collaborative learning, peer tutoring, student-led teams, uh, and other activities. Um, some other specific examples in my class, uh, the, these are the activities that I do. Uh, I, I ask them to pair share, peer critique, do a case analysis, interact in the discussion forum, do a collaborative writing or presentation, a peer review of work, and even debate. Okay, so, and then of course we have the teacher-teacher interaction. So this type of interaction can be in the form of professional development and support through a scholarly uh, community of teachers. So teachers can interact with other teachers to share best practices or experiences in terms of content, technology, and pedagogy. So later on, if you are now going through with the semester for school year 20, 2021, you can still continue with this kind of webinar series so that uh, you teachers can interact with one another, uh, share best practices, and this becomes a support uh, platform for you um, especially those who are just um, new to this type of uh, modality. And then, um, the content, content interaction. So in this type of interaction, oftentimes content is programmed to interact with other automated information sources so as to refresh itself constantly and to acquire new capabilities. So this is very... Um, there are a lot of developments and advances in this field, especially with the um, uh, rise of the artificial intelligence as well as the data analytics. Okay. Okay. So now that we have discussed the definitions, uh, the, the definition, the importance, um, what else have we discussed? The framework, uh, the design principle, uh, the various interaction, 
uh, that happen in open and distance e-learning, uh, let us now move uh, into the process of instructional design. So uh, you have to take into consideration all those that we have discussed earlier in order to, for you to design effectively. Okay, so um, this is actually, I'm sure all of you knows about this model or maybe, maybe not all of you, but uh, since most of you are educators or teachers, you've probably encountered this model. And this is actually um, uh, very popular. So let us uh, take this model uh, in the design of our instruction. So we have the ADI mo model, which is one of the most uh, popular instructional uh, design models used for technology based teaching. And according to Bates, uh, uh, this model is applied on iterative basis with evaluating leading to reanalysis and further design and development modi modifications. So this is not linear, this is not just circular, but it's actually iterative. So you can go back and forth in various areas of the model. So ID stands for analyze, design, develop, implement, and evaluate. Okay, so ID. Um, this is a very uh, basic and quite popular uh, in designing instruction. So let's uh, go through this one by one. So the analyze stage includes um, identifying all the variables that need to be considered when designing the course, such as the learner characteristics, uh, learner's prior knowledge, resources, uh, uh, what are the availability of res uh, resources, etc. And then the design stage includes um, identifying, of course, identifying the learning objectives or outcomes for the course and how the materials will be created and designed and deciding on the selection and use of technology, such as are you going to use a learning management system or probably your students are just using data and uh, internet connectivity would be a problem and they can only access Facebook. So you can probably explore the use of social media or probably other media such as video. And then another is the develop stage, which includes the creation of content, uh, including whether to develop in-house or outsource, Caporate clearance for third party materials, as well as the loading of content into a website or LMS and so on. And then the implement uh, stage, this stage is ac the actual delivery of the course. So you have, uh, you have designed and developed the course and now you are ready to roll out or to deploy or deliver the course. Uh, but of course, it includes any prior training or briefing of learner support staff as well as student assessment. And then um, included in the implementation stage are collecting feedback and data in order to identify areas that require um, improvement. And this feeds into the design again and develop, development and implementation of the next which is why I said it's actually an iterative process. And then of course, um, the evaluation. So uh, the evaluation stage includes um, collecting feedback and data in order to do the particular course. Okay, so this is actually the ADI model. So as you can see, you have to analyze, you design, you develop, you implement, you evaluate. And then based from your evaluation, you can uh, again, uh, go back to the analysis uh, stage or uh, if you think that everything is okay, you can redesign it or then do some um, updating in the content, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And some modification in the implementation. Okay. So, um, now, with all those principles and process in mind, let's try to look. I want you to look at uh, open distance e-learning from a systems perspective. 
So these are there are actually four uh, component of components of the system. So you have the course design and development. Uh, you have the teaching and learning, which is the course delivery. And then the student support and the organization and management. Now, what we have discussed earlier applies to both course design and development as well as the course delivery. But as an educator and an, an educational institution, you also have to consider student support and as well as the organization and management. Um, but these two components on the bottom uh, merit a separate discussion. So um, probably Chad can um, uh, organize another um, series for the for the other types uh, for the other components. Now, with what we have learned uh, in this afternoon, maybe you are now ready to do your design of your of your course. So let us do a course planning and design. We will now apply the principles and processes and try to look at how we can plan and design an actual course to be delivered via open and distance e-learning for the first semester school year 2020-21. So here are the tasks that you would do. So um, first, of course, based on the principles that we have learned earlier, you have to analyze your learner. Now, since you will not be meeting them face to face anymore all the time, this is a very important task that you should not skip. Even if you know the learners, uh, you have asked them, I mean, probably they were your students in previous semester, um, you know them by names, you know them uh, individually, but this is now a different situation. You are now um, doing a different modality and it is very important that you analyze your learners so you should know the characteristics of all your learners and um, let us just focus on five uh, characteristics so in terms of diversity the goal now is to bring as many students as possible to the standards required so rather than focus on just the needs of the most able students, you have to consider all the other needs of other students. This means finding ways of helping a very wide range of students with very different levels of ability and our prior knowledge to succeed. Uh, and then we have the learning context. Uh, you have to consider several contexts of diverse students. So um, remember, uh, they are now in their homes with a diverse uh, context and learning environment. With this current pandemic, it is important to focus on the work and home context. So in the current scenario, there is increasing need for more flexibility in their studying. So you should know what are their contexts. Do they have access to the internet? Do they have parents supporting them? Do they have electricity? Um, what are the current contexts, both at work, uh, both at home, and uh, probably some of them are working. And then learners' goals. You have to understand the motivation of students and what they expect to get out of a course or program should also influence the design of your course. So it is uh, often necessary to find ways to move students whose approach to learning is initially driven by extrinsic rewards such as grades or qualifications, an approach that engages and motivates students in the subject matter itself. And then you have prior knowledge or skills. So future learning often depends on students uh, having prior knowledge or ability to do things at a certain level. So Teachers aim to bridge the difference between what a learner can do without help and what he or she can do with help. Some students may not have the same basic knowledge as others in a course and will need more help. So in such context, it is important to design the learning experience so that it is flexible enough to accommodate students with a wide range of prior knowledge and skills. And then another learner characteristics that is a characteristic that is very important is knowing about these digital natives. 
Um, these are the Gen Z. Our students are now the Gen Z and they are digital natives. And most of them have grown up with digital technologies such as mobile phones, tablets, social media, including Facebook, uh, Twitter, and blogs. And um, literature would argue that not only are such students more proficient in using such technologies uh, than previous generations, but that they also think differently. Um, however, it is particularly important to understand that students' use of digital technologies that does not naturally flow across into educational use. So uh, oftentimes, uh, students just use technology for um, social interaction purposes, for example, the social media, and they would not uh, uh, um, even think of um, uh, letting um, educational purposes uh, um, probably be included in their social media interaction. So um, it is important that when you do this, you, the teachers should make a good case for it. And that uh, as teachers, you, you can see that the use of digital me uh, media will directly help them in their studies, uh, the students. Um, so these various characteristics, um, these are just a few of the critical factors that um, I can think of right now that should influence the design of teaching. Um, but there are other characteristics such as learning style, uh, gender differences, cultural background, um, uh, probably indigenous uh, background or context. And you can, it's good also to consider them depending on the context. So whatever the context, a good design in teaching requires good information about the learners uh, that you are going to teach. And in particular, good design needs to address the increasing diversity of the students. Okay, now uh, the second task is now for you to review the learning outcomes and course outline. So you are not really starting from scratch, right? Because you are actually offering these courses face-to-face, uh, -face, which means you have existing learning outcomes and course outline. So what you will do is go back to your course syllabus and try to review your learning outcomes. So um, uh, for many universities, uh, course syllabi are approved at the university level and you cannot just change them. So uh, you have to observe the process uh, on which uh, you'll be able to uh, modify or um, revise those learning outcomes. Um, so, uh, this is not something that you should do individually, but should be done uh, on an institutional level based on the standards set by your institution. Um, always remember that learning outcomes are written with the learners in mind, uh, and learning outcomes must be learner-centered, should break down the tasks and focus on cognitive processes, should use action verbs, and should be measurable. Um, and Learning outcomes are stated using verbs that describe the student's expected behavior or action. Now, the third task now for you to structure the course content into specific modules. Um, so the next, step, the next step now in your design is to translate your course outline, your course syllabus, into a list of module topics and subtopics. So, the, some institutions refer to modules as units, which is equivalent to a chapter in a book. Uh, each module or unit usually corresponds, for example, to a week's work, although the timeline would depend on the topic. What is important here is not just to cover all the key topics, but to ensure that the content is chunked into modules uh, and are sequenced, collect, uh, uh, sequenced correctly or logically. Um, so it is always recommended to break down information into smaller, more manageable pieces or chunking. Okay, so uh, you probably say, oh, there's so many things to teach students, so many things to include. Uh, so Bates and Poole um, 
uh, made this recommendation and they said they noted the importance of avoiding overloading students by classifying topics as follows. So, uh, topics that are essential to know, meaning they are relative to the target learning outcomes. And then there are also topics that are useful to know. Again, they are relative to the target learning outcomes. And there are also topics that are merely interesting to know and can therefore be skipped. Okay, so here are some three chunking strategies. So you classify and prioritize the course content. So you remove irrelevant or unnecessary information. Efficiently group your course content. So se separate your course content into modules and then divide them into section or topics. And then organize your information. Content should have a rational flow, starting from basic and broad concepts and then progressively advance into more complex ideas. So each con uh, concept should contain the right amount of information. So please highlight. Um, they should you should break down information into smaller, more manageable, uh, more manage, uh, manageable pieces or chunks. Okay. Now, the next um, step now is for you to select learning resources. Uh, in open and distance e-learning, the teacher now um, becomes the... Um, facilitator. So he or she is not the sage on the stage anymore. So the role is become uh, uh, the role of a teacher now is more of a facilitator of learning, which is important which which is why it is important that you select uh, appropriate learning resources for your courses. So what are learning resources? So these are uh, any form of material which are produced, purchased, acquired, developed, or created for instructional purposes that is used for formal, non-formal, or informal teaching or learning purposes. So they can actually be in print mode, non-print, which are videos, audio, still photographs, animations, or it can even be a human resource or a teacher. And then um, learning resources allow learners to explore, collaborate, solve problems, create and develop new ideas, knowledge, and skills. So it's important that you really select appropriate learn, uh, learning resources for your courses. Now, what are some types of learning resources? So I've already mentioned this. Um, it can be pre-recorded. Uh, for example, uh, 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 some of the webinars in the past uh, sessions have been recorded and they have been uploaded uh, in YouTube. So they become recorded resources. Now, this particular uh, um, activity that we're, we are doing is a live source, meaning I'm delivering my lecture to you live. So I'm the subject matter expert and I'm delivering a particular content to you live. So these are the type of uh, learning resources. Uh, now we upload into YouTube uh, so that source. Okay, so not, now let us uh, take a look at open educational resources. I'm not sure if you have uh, heard about open educational resources, but as I've, I've mentioned, UNESCO has been advocating for open educational resources, and many countries all over the world have um, signed their agreement on the use of open education among basic education, especially on educational sectors that are being subsidized by the government. So what are open educational resources? Uh, these are any type of educational materials that are in the public domain or introduced with an open license. Uh, usually, uh, you can see there the Creative Commons license. And the nature of these open materials means that anyone can legally and freely copy use, adapt, and reshare them. And OERs range from textbooks to curricula, syllabi, lecture notes, assignments, tests, projects, audio, video, and animation. So um, just to highlight, OERs are free, they are publicly available, and you can copy, use, adapt, and reshare them. 
So, it's a good OER. So, they should be findable. They are imperfect because you can improve on them. They are clearly described, clearly licensed, meaning they are licensed under Creative Commons. And they are recommended uh, by um, experts in the field. They are copyright free, freestanding, easily modified, and from trusted sources. Okay. Now, um, the next step is now for you to design learning activities. Um, what is a learning activity? So, learning activity is, a, uh, according to Bitham, specific is a specific interaction of learners with others using specific tools and resources oriented towards specific outcomes. So learning activities help learners understand the content that has been selected. Hence, they must be aligned with the learning objectives and content resources for the modules. So activity is considered as the most important part of teaching and learning, especially in open and distance e-learning, that will help students achieve the learning outcomes. In designing learning activities, it is important to have a clear task and learning scaffold. So uh, a learning activity provides opportunities for learners to understand a concept or principle or practice a skill and to apply this in their own setting and context. As learning tasks become more complex, <clears throat> example, solving complex math formulas or equations or dissecting a live species, Activities become more and more essential to learning. Um, learning activity also keep learners purposely engaged with the material and without such activities, the learners may, might just assume that the only objective was to memorize the information set before them. So learning activity must promote active learning to help students retain more information presented and understand concepts at a deeper level since students apply them in the real world context. So let me share with you uh, some activities as class, uh, cl classification of uh, different types of learning activities um, by the University of Tasmania. So um, one type is uh, focus on content, content focus and interaction. So what are examples? Listening to and or watching a live or recorded talk, engaging with a written or visual text, engaging with a multimedia or a combination of this. For this type of activity, students are more likely to retain information if they are asked to interact with the material in some way. Example, you ask or invite students or include another activity after every five or 15 minutes um, of your engagement. Um, and then interactivity with others, uh, focus. So this can be facilitating synchronous discussion, jigsaw collaborative, collaborative information sharing, group assignments. Now, it is important to include learning activities that foster open communication and interaction with others. Another type is um, activity focused on critical thinking. So, what are examples of this? So, uh, examples are response to an assigned text, or pro another example is a digital story development. So you design activities that will give students opportunities to think about or use knowledge and information in new and different ways, which will help them develop critical thinking skills. Another type of uh, activity is the production. So this requires skills, specific output. So for example, you ask your students to develop infographic, ask them to develop uh, oral summary or Story or communicator. So you ask students to produce an output that will allow them to engage with ideas and concepts and have deeper uh, and have learning. Okay, excuse me for a while. Okay, and then another type is a problem solving type of activity. Examples are simulation or your case studies or class solution and consequence. So what you do here is you present students with a problem or a scenario or a case, then you challenge, uh, challenge or design issue and ask them to resolve, address, meet, or deal with the problem presented. And then um, next is reflection. 
So you can have, you can design self-assessment or, or reflection and learning or reflection in prior understanding. So you provide activity that allows students to think about what they already know and have experience in relation to the topic being explored or studied. And this is followed by analysis of why the students think about the topics in the way they do and what assumptions, attitudes, and beliefs they have about and bring to learn about the topic. Okay, so let me just run through some uh, examples. Um, then I think um, we can conclude the presentation. So these are just some of the types of um, instructional strategy. Anyway, this video will be shared so you can just go back to it. So, for example, you want uh, the content type are facts. For example, association between two pieces of information. So, for example, it's history, columnus and 1492, the year 1492. What type of instructional strategy can you use? You can probably uh, do a rehearsal, a practice strategy, or mnemonics. So, these are examples. So, um, you can. If the, con if the type of uh, uh, content is on procedural, so, so uh, as a specific instructional strategy that uh, you can use is a paraphrasing procedure. Okay, uh, or elaborate on the specific of each step or practice the procedure through application. Okay, so here are more examples. So again, um, for example, if it requires judgment, you ask your student to review cases, you ask them questions, and you, you, act, you, you make them uh, do actual choices and receive feedback and coaching. Okay, so if it's about um, theories, then you have probably do some logic, explanation, and questioning. So another example, so... If it's a uh, learner, learner, you can do ask them to order or probably some case study exercises. Okay, so if it's learner teacher, you can uh, ask them to write essay and then you as a teacher would give feedback to them or you can ask them to compile their um uh, what they have done for the class and you have a portfolio, etc. So uh, here's another type of learning activity. So for example, you can even have problem-based learning wherein students can learn uh, real-life problems and solutions. Okay, so here are other types of activities. Okay, now we go to assessment. So assessment is used to describe the various methods used to determine the extent to which learners achieve the intended learning outcomes of instruction. So the key to quality assessment is to ensure that the right samples of a learner's work are gathered in order to accurately make inferences about the extent of learning or achievement. So it's important that you design um, assessment strategies that would uh, surface the work of the students. So it's not enough that you just do multiple, multiple choice types of assessment anymore because it's important that as a teacher, you should be able to make accurate inferences on the extent of learning or achievement of learning outcomes by the students. Okay, so what are some of the characteristics of online, uh, online assessment? So construct, uh, assessment reflects the content area that all learners need to know. Um, uh, assessment involves activities based on significant aspects of the subject area. And then coherence. Assessment is a coherent process involving subliment. So assessment process should form a coherent whole. Assessment matches the purpose for which it is being done. And the assessment is aligned with the curriculum, instruction, and predefined learning outcomes. And then, of course, modes. Multiple modes of assessment should be applied for online learning. So I've been say, as I've said, it's not enough that you should just um, develop multiple choice uh, type of assessment anymore, but you should allow for um, peer or group 
uh, appraisal, learner, or self-assessment. Um, in order for you to be able to assess uh, if the student really are able to uh, accomplish the learning outcomes. So, um, and then um, these are other um, areas uh, for online assessment. Um, so you can just uh, go back to this uh, detail. Go back to this in detail. Um, so let me just run through some principles for assessing learning. Um, so good practice encourages learner faculty contact. So instructors should provide clear gu guidelines for interaction. Uh, Well-designed discussion assignment facilitate meaningful cooperation among learners. Um, so when you're designing um, a collaborative activity, the tasks should be very detailed. Uh, remember, uh, you are now, you will not be meeting your students face to face daily anymore. So everything should, every task should be described in detail. Um, then good practice encourages active learners. So should allow your students to present uh, their outputs even if it's done online. Um, so this is one way that you can do it. Or if uh, synchronous type is not uh, possible, you can ask your students probably to video record their output and then submit to you uh, the link so you can uh, uh, assess later. Um, and then instructors need to provide two types of feedback, information feedback and acknowledgement feedback. So you should acknowledge the submission of your students. Okay, uh, and then good practice emphasizes time on task. So uh, it is very important that your task should be very detailed. Uh, when, is the when is the assignment or a particular task due? How it will be submitted by the students? And what are the specific requirements needed? So everything should be uh, done in detail. Uh, and then you should uh, communi uh, practice, communication, uh, practice to communicate high expectation. So you should um, aim for the higher order thinking skills. So you should do challenging tasks, sample cases, and praise for quality work. And then uh, good practice respects diverse talents and ways of learning. So you allow le your learners to choose project topics which incorporates diver diverse views into online courses. Now to highlight, uh, it is important to emphasize that the content, <coughs> the learning activities, and the assessment, st assessment strategies must be aligned with the learning outcome. And all these three components must help the students accomplish the learning outcomes of the course. So uh, when you design your instruction, you should bear in mind that all these areas um, should address the learning outcome of that particular course. Okay, so um, in this frame now, in this slide, uh, this, is, this is what we call in UPOUS the horizontal plan. So you can probably uh, take a screenshot uh, and this will be your plan. Uh, you can consider this as your plan uh, in, in designing your actual course. So for example, you have a timeline, for example, one week, and then you are able to structure your course and chunk them into modules. So for example, one course, for example, um, basics of algebra, you'll probably have uh, five main topics or probably have five modules. And then for each module, you should have learning outcomes. And then for each module, you should identify the topics and the subtopics. And then you will identify the learning resources. When you do the learning resources, you should be very detailed and you should do some annotation. For example, you put there, um, video lecture on uh, video lecture on um, a specific topic, and then you annotate that video lecture. Why why should a student watch that? What specific um, knowledge and skills uh, should uh, they learn or should they acquire in watching that particular resource? Or for example, you put a resource uh, chapter in a book. So do you expect your student to read the entire chapter or you just want to read them a certain portion of the book? And then you annotate that particular resource again as it relates to the other uh, parts of the 
uh, topic or module. And then the learning activity. So for example, is it a discussion forum? Is it a collaborative type of activity? Is it um, a debate, etc.? And then in the last column, you put in the assessment type. Is it a quiz? Is it an essay? Is it a final exam, a midterm, or, or whatever type of assessment? Now, all these, all these columns should be aligned with each other and should address the specific learning outcomes per module. So, um, you, when you put in a learning resource, you should ensure that that particular resource addresses the learning outcomes that you put there. So again, go back to the um, uh, topics which we have discussed earlier. There are some topics that are just good to know, and you can probably skip those topics. So now focus on the learning outcomes, and what are the topics, what are the subtopics, what are the learning resources, what are the learning tasks or activity that will address that specific learning outcomes, and how, you will, how will you assess that the student has actually achieve that specific learning outcome. Okay, so uh, I hope you're able to screenshot this one because this serves, this will serve as your horizontal plan or the basis for your instructional design. And then the next, uh, the next step now is you put everything together and then you can probably produce your own uh, module or uh, study guide or instructional material. Okay, I think uh, that's, that ends my presentation and I would be happy to uh, we welcome uh, questions from you. That, um, yeah, I'm, I'm now open for it. Mom, Jenna. I'm Jen Kenley, unmute your microphone. Um, uh, we have around 10 minutes. I hope we still have 10 minutes for questions and answer. Uh, Excuse me, Ma'am Jen, hindi ka marinig, Ma'am Jen. Narinig na po ako. Yes, Ma'am, we can hear you po. So, and we are open for um, viewers from our attending. On my end, para akong nagkaroon ng crash course, para review ng pagkarami-raming courses during my undergraduate program, ma'am, mula sa of the plan hanggang sa assessment tuloy-tuloy. So, and I'm sure others also are feeling uh, very overwhelmed right now considering that so far and because you should only be ready to be uh, I think many of the people are asking for presentation. <laughs> I, uh, um, Jenna, I will share po. Uh, I will. Sh I will. Sh I will share po this PDF slides to you and Sir Randy and Sir Rod, so you can just send them to the participants. Wow. Thank you very much for your generosity. Mm -hmm. Academic honesty in online. Mm -hmm. 
Dok Joan, may question po dito. Babasahin ko na lang po ito. Dok Joan. Okay yes, sir. Okay po. Po. We have a question from Sir Charlie Dayon. May question po siya dito. No? Uh, I have two questions for our generous resource speaker to answer. First, how can the learners be involved in the instructional design when their physical presence in the school is restricted? Second, is the instructional design for ODL be limited or determined by the peculiarities of HCIs in terms of vision and mission? Thank you very much uh, for the question. So for the first question, how can the learners be involved in the instructional design when the physical presence in the school is restricted? So when doing a learner analysis, you can probably design a Google form where you can send um, the questions to your students uh, so that they can access them online for those with online access. For those with no online access, you can probably uh, print them and uh, send them, uh, I don't know how you can, uh, if you have uh, a way of sending them to students with no access or um, I know that some students still have access to Facebook just with uh, free data. So I think this is now the time where you can actually maximize the affordance of social media uh, in terms of educational purposes. So when doing an analysis, for it's not just one form, uh, one delivery format or one um, type. So you can um, uh, maximize all types of, uh, all, all ways, uh, wherein you can reach your students. So um, I'm not at the liberty to say how because I do not know the context of your students, uh, but it's important that you should be able to reach them. So um, kahit po ka basic as uh, writing down the questions and sending, sending the questions via text is okay. As long as you are able to get uh, their current context right now. Uh, iba na po kasi ngayon, uh, unlike in a face-to-face -face session, ang bilis eh, parang you just ask them and then you assume that um, everyone is on the same uh, field or uh, playing field. Pero ngayon, um, some students would have uh, no access to the internet. So napaka-importanteng malaman po natin yon. Some students would probably have difficulty um, watching videos dahil medyo kailangan ng malakas na bandwidth. So, those different contexts ay dapat pong malaman natin, including yung mga prior knowledge and skills natin. Kasi, imagine, na-imagine na po natin yung mangyayari. It's like uh, an individualized or a personalized instruction. Kasi, very diverse yung mga studyante natin. Unlike in a face-to-face, -face, you're just there as a teacher and then you just lecture something, and then you um, assess the students. So basically, parang ganun nangyayari, kal kalimitan. But now, they, you won't be able to face them at all. I mean, um, siguro itong first semester natin, basically, uh, I'm, I'm imagining na wala talagang face-to-face -face session. So you should be able to reach them para po kayong makapag-design. Kasi otherwise, magiging one-size-fits-all ang design ninyo na instruction. Um, so, importante po na you try all, uh, all means para sila maabot, as basic as SMS or text message. Uh, yung isa naman po, instructional design for ODAL be limited or determined by the peculiarities of HEIs in terms of vision and mission. Um, in, some, in some context po, medyo totoo po ito, no? pero uh, we have to, as an institution, we have to talk about what you are doing right now. So, um, ano po ba yung ginagawa ninyo for the semester? Are you preparing because there's an emergency? Uh, is this a remote type of teaching and learning? Ibig sabihin, pag wala na po itong pandemic, you will go back to the way you were teaching in the past. Uh, so, yan po yung remote teaching. Or, are you going for something that is more integrative? Ibig sabihin, i-integrate nyo na talaga ang technology 
in the way you teach uh, your courses. So, yung po yung medyo institutional lang approach. Uh, as an institution, you should be able to um, address this first uh, para yung mga teachers natin, alam din nila um, how they will proceed. Um, kasi many are saying now that this is just remote teaching. Uh, when we look at the definition po of remote teaching, um, medyo transitionary ang nature niya. Ibig sabihin, this is something that we will do right now uh, because there is a crisis. So we will be teaching them remotely kung nasaan man sila, anywhere in the, in the area. Um, pero ang idea nun, eventually, after the pandemic, we will go back to the way uh, we used to teach our students. So hindi masyadong malawak or mahaba ang uh, pagpaplano natin. But if you are thinking thinking of an open and distance e-learning type of framework, then medyo i-integrate nyo na po yung technology in enhancing the learning experiences of students. So yung po yung medyo mas ma long term na. Kaya importante na po na maipasok siya sa vision and mission ng university or ng HDI na yun. So that's something that should be considered by uh, each institution po. And probably CHED as well. Yeah, we have. Thank you, Dr. John. We we have another question po from Facebook Live. Uh, this is from Sir Dexter Lagumbay. Ang question niya po is, how will student gain the necessary skills after after viewing demo video, especially if it entails utilization of sophisticated laboratory equipment physically available only in school. Thank you. Thank you po uh, for that question. Medyo, that's really a complex question po. Ano, kasi talagang parang all, all of us are caught off guard and uh, medyo very limited yung time ng preparation natin. But we have to make do of, uh, we have to make do with what we have. Which is why po, in, it's important that uh, bago nyo ito i-implement or i-deliver this first semester, you really should plan for this one. So, ito po yung purpose ng instructional design. Uh, Doon po sa diniscuss kong mga learning activities. So, for example, you ask your students to watch, to watch a particular video. So, after po ng watching ng video, you should uh, write down a series of questions that will help address yung learning outcomes. So, depende po yun kung ano ba yung objective nyo. Is it the process procedural type? It's a content type? So, doon magbabase po yung type ng question na i-design nyo. So, for example, after watching the video, ano ang ina-expect mo pong uh, behavior ng studyante na yun. So, i-phrase nyo po ng ganun yung questions. And then, uh, pwede nyo po siyang ipa-recreate. For example, uh, yung video ay step-by-step -step procedure on doing something. And then you can probably ask them to do something similar to what the video has shown using uh, specific uh, real-life uh, scenario. Ibig sabihin, for example, nagdi-discuss kayo uh, ng lab instead na laboratory, gawin nyo po siya ano ang mga pwedeng gawin sa bahay. So, as a teacher, kasama yung sa design ninyo, you will think of um, ano ba yung mga available na uh, gamit nila sa bahay na pwede nilang gawin sa pag -e experiment ng gantong klaseng scenario. So, kayo po yun, medyo, as I've said earlier in the uh, earlier discussion, uh, importante po yung pre-planning. Medyo, an laki po ng trabaho nito sa teacher. In fact, Itong June to July nyo na to, this is really a time for you to really, really be creative. So for example, sa, lab sa laboratory po, ganito ka-high tech, you will think of um, similar uh, um, experiments na pwede nilang gawin sa bahay na ganun din po yung konsepto or ganun din yung idea na makukuha nila. So uh, yung limitation po kasi hindi, hindi tayo dapat maging limited dun sa, ito lang yung laboratory. So we have to think of similar um, scenario na pwede nilang gawin sa bahay or something na ganun din po yung magiging uh, outcome. Um, medyo mah mahirap po ito sa part ng teacher but this is really the, the 
um, basic premise while we are designing instruction. Pre-planning po talaga siya lahat. So, uh, iisipin na po natin yung, kaya dapat malaman natin yung context ng sudyante. Ano ba yung mga available resources sa kanila para pag nagpagawa ka na experiment sa bahay on their own, ay uh, safe naman at kaya nilang sundan. So, yun po yung mga example. So, after watching something, dapat meron ka na pong activity na ipapagawa sa kanila. Uh, and very crucial na yung activity na yun would address the learning outcome. Yeah. Thank you, Ma'am Joanne. Uh, Ma'am Ma Jenna, is your microphone okay now? Uh, parang yes, siguro sir. Uh, better na okay. po. Malakas okay. na. Okay. okay, better. Okay po. Thank you. I'm um, sorry. <laughs> Technical issues on my part. So, we have here medyo may mga similar questions like how do we ensure academic honesty in online instruction? And siguro similarly, like how do we ensure that assessment that we give to our students online are not done by their parents or others? From Professor Navales. Okay, thank you for that question po. Ano, uh, assessment is really a challenge in online uh, open and distance e-learning po. Ano, um, this has been a continuing challenge for many teachers, which is why important din po yung instructional design dito. So, when designing assessment, kailangan pong i-collect natin, uh, an, uh, we design an assessment that collect data across a time, across the semester. Ibig sabihin, across po dun sa lahat ng uh, pwedeng gawin ng estudyante. And then we compare kung yung output po na yun ay comparative. Kasi makikita mo yan, for example, sa klase ko po. Uh, uh, you ask them to do self-reflection and then you ask them to do um, case studies or analysis of certain aspects. Makikita mo po yung pagsusulat nila, yung the way they write, uh, paano sila mag-argue out. Makikita mo po yun na uh, kung mag-iiba o hindi. So as a teacher dapat po you you'll be able to be able to judge yung uh, collection ng mga pieces of work nila na yon which is why dapat po meron kayong variety of assessment strategies uh, hindi pwedeng isang type of essay lang isang type of question lang isang type of assessment lang so dapat po may variety of strategies kayo uh, ngayon po yung iba yung exam na pinaka basic syempre na ginagawa minsan uh, so they ask a um, for example instead na written pwedeng oral so for example one on one tayo i will ask you certain concepts and then sasagutin mo ako. So, you, if possible. Pero kung halimbawa po you have like 50 or 60 students and it would be impossible. And then you devise other means na medyo makakapture nyo po yung ganung klaseng um, type of assessment. Uh, ang importante po dito, varied yung assessment strategies ninyo uh, para makapag-judge po kayo na yung work na yun ng sudyante ay kanya talaga. Uh, and then you devise siguro at the end of the semester, talagang way na uh, kung gusto nyo talaga na exam, so uh, yung iba po ang ginagawa, nagpapa, parang pinapa-video camera nila while the students are taking exams, so pinaproctor ng teacher, so o kaya po yun nga, oral exam. So um, mer meron po yung oral exam, it can be a uh, synchronous or asynchronous. Yung ibang mga teacher na talagang very particular sa ganito, Talagang synchronous po. So like ganito, may question and then you answer. So yun po, uh, varied types of assessment and ensure that you're able to uh, capture yung pong, uh, parang pagpo-progress ng sagot ng mga sudyante. Um, another way po na, ano, na madali ninyo itong ma-compile is for students to do a portfolio. Uh, so para po ko ay makikita nyo yung trabaho nila through time. I hope that answers the question. So very, ano po, uh, I think that would be very helpful to everyone, no? um, considering that it is really a, a concern, especially for those who will be implementing this kind of remote teaching and learning in the coming semesters. Um, we have a set of questions, pero parang pare pareho yung ano nila, concern, like, can, is it advisable to use design by learning outcomes in technical courses? Possible ba yung ating um, this type of uh, distance learning with in subjects with laboratory experiments? 
and also those with uh, skills-based subjects. Um, yes po, possible pa rin po yun. So, uh, for each subject, be it technical or not, meron pa rin kayong specific competency or an outcome that you want to uh, uh, your, that you want your learners to acquire. So basically, yung pa rin po yun, you design base kung ano yung outcome or base kung anong competency yung gusto ninyong ma, um, ma-acquire ng learners ninyo. So yun po yung pinaka-basic premise doon. So pag na-define um, na nyo po yun ng malinaw, and then yung pong horizontal plan na shinare ko kanina would be very, very useful. Kasi pag na identify nyo na po yun, even if it's a technical course. So, for example, at the end of this session, dapat yung mga bata ay marunong na mag-welding or something. Hindi ko po alam. Ano po yung, um, uh, ano po yung topic or subtopic na pwede pang maging doon? So, pwede pong procedural yon. So, halimbawa, uh, malaman nila kung ano mga require, uh, mga support, uh, sorry, mga requirements na kailangan, magamit nila itong gantong klase mga tools, etc. So, yun po yung mga topic and subtopic. Then, ano po yung learning resources? So, identify nyo po yun. Halimbawa, may video po ang TESDA. So, ito yung learning resource ninyo, video ng TESDA. Lalagyan nyo po yun ng annotation. So, itong video na to ay nagpapakita, for example, kung paano gamitin itong specific tool na ito. Then, after po nung learning resource na yun, bibigyan nyo sila ng learning activity. So, uh, sundan uh, step by step ang ginawa na napanood ninyo sa video. So, parang ganun po yung progression ninyon. So, hindi po to pang cognitive or pang uh, academic courses lang. Uh, pwede nyo rin po siyang gamitin for technical or uh, experimental courses. Ang uh, importante po, meron ka syempre yung learning outcome lagi. Yun lagi ang ating basehan or accomplishment etensi na gusto lang ma-acquire. And then from there, dun po ninyo ibabase lahat na yung succeeding steps na ginawa natin. So, dun nyo po babase yung um, -top uh, topic and subtopic. Dun nyo ibabase yung mga learning resources. Dun nyo ibabase yung learning activities as well as the assessment. Thank you. Thank you po. Um, uh, may specific question. How about for law school? For law school, um, as a matter of course, uh, would you recommend po yung senior nyo na distance learning? Uh, yes po ma'am. Uh, yung pong, yung pong, ano, yung pong the principles that I, I uh, shared with everyone is actually applicable uh, to all types. Uh, Nagmamatter lang po dito talaga ma'am uh, at sir. Uh, yung the way you design the activities now. So, may shinare po ako dun sa towards the end po, di ba? So, kailangan i-identify niyo yung specific content na dapat nilang ma malaman. Is it, a, is it a fact? So, syempre, sa law, for example, basically mga facts yan. Pwede rin yung mga philosophies and epistemologies. And then, pag identify niyo yung specific type of content na yon anong klaseng activities ba ang magiging appropriate dito? So, pwede debate. So, how do you debate? So, for an asynchronous type sa learning management system po, pwede po kayong mag-create doon ng debate. So, pwede niyong debate na written. So, halimbawa, meron kayo ipopost na isang uh, um, kaso at sasabihin niyo sa mga sudyante, i-argue niyo to. This type of, ito yung pro and ito yung against. So, mag-argue sila. It can be uh, in a written format or sabihin niyo na uh, in an oral format. So, pwede pong synchronous. Pwede kayong mag-set up ng webinar. Or kung asynchronous po, you ask your students to video record themselves arguing a certain concept. So, depende po yun sa design lagi. So, um, magagawa po yun depende doon sa pre-planned activities na gagawin. So, ang ano ba, basic premise po dito, magiging sobrang creative po tayo yung mga teachers ngayon. Kung Unlike before na ang gagawin natin siyempre, oh, ilelecture ko na lang to kasi para matapos na. Ngayon po, mag-iisip kayo ng mga learning resources which are available in the internet. Pero ngayon, kayo po, kung halimbawa sa palagay nyo, you think that uh, you are more comfortable with you uh, providing the input, then what you can do is record, do a recording of all uh, lectures that you would like to be recorded 
And then afterwards, you can ask your students to uh, watch the video lectures. Ang importante lang po, it's not just watching. After that, what are the activities required uh, from the students to do with the material that they watch? So after watching, ano na po ang gabi nila? So you can probably uh, do some reflection questions, ask them to do an essay, or kung ano man po. Yun yung po yung activity na sinasabi ko. Doon po kasi nagbo-boil down yung learning. So it's not just yung uh, the, the after watching, tapos na. Wala na silang gagawin. So ano po yung expectation natin after watching relative to the learning outcome? So yan po. We may very uh, realistic question po dito. Uh, what is the suggested number of students uh, per online course or per online class? Do you have any suggestion? Suggested number of students per online class or course. Do we have an ideal number? Okay. Uh, from experience na lang po, ma'am, ano po? So, UPOU po, we have 1 is to 25 or up to 1 is to 30. So, one, student, one teacher handles a section composed of 30 students. Uh, and then after that, it will break down no po in another section. So, yung halimbawa, 31 to 60 would mean another uh, section. Uh, ngayon po, pwede rin po yung teacher pa rin mag-handle. Pero, we usually get a tutor. Uh, so, if you have... Uh, 60 students, then pwede kang kumuha ng tutor that will as who will assist you in the another section na uh, dahil po dun sa another 30. So like for example, minsan may student, may student kami na class na 100, so you can get a number of tutors for that. So yung po yung from experience, 1 to 25 or 1 is to 30. We, um... Given my question, another question is that given that teachers will not be 100% sure that ayong academic honesty nga na concern, will there still be an academic recognition? Do you think there is still a need for it po? According, uh, the question is from May Rodrigo. When you say po academic recognition, it's yung mga like uh, giving honor system. Ganun po. Is that it po ba? Uh, or cum laude, mga ganun po. Yeah, I, I think po ma'am, wala na Kasi, um, we should, ako po personally, we should not be bagged down by the, some of the challenges like honesty or integrity. Kasi po, lahat po na to can be uh, integrated in your design. Um, kailangan lang po, mai, um, sobrang detailed po yung the way you design a specific assessment para po kayo mismo you would be confident enough na yung student niyo hindi nag cheat so uh when well, assessment po is it's not just matatapos doon sa paggawa niyo ng question itself dapat po kasama po doon yung um itong assessment na to ba how will it assess the student so meron po tayong iba-ibang klasing assessment yung assessment of learning assessment for learning and assessment as learning so pwede nyo pong integrate yung assessment as learning. So, para yung ating pong, this is really actually a shift in paradigm. So, wag po na yung maging mabag down dun sa idea na assessment comes at the end of the course. Kasi alam naman po natin sa totoo lang lahat na teacher, pag uh, depende po yan sa mga, yun, alam mo yun, sa mood ng sudyante, nakapag-aral ba, nakapag-memorize ba, and then at the end of the course, basically, ang nangyayari, route memorization lang naman. Kasi you, that's the way um, summative assessments are done oftentimes. So, pwede po natin i-maximize yung affordances nitong tatlong types of assessment. So, assessment as learning po, napaka-importante po nito. Ibig sabihin, yung studyante, the way you design your course is that the, the assessment itself is considered as a learning ng studyante. Uh, and then, you just don't assess their learning, but you also design yung uh, assessment for learning. So, sa buong klase po, ma'am, pwede nyo integrate yung iba't ibang klase ng assessment na yon, na hindi ka na lang uh, nagre-rely dun sa pinaka-final exam or yung mga summative type of assessment at the end of the courses. 
So, I mean, yeah, that's who my uh, personal opinion. So, although may mga questions pa po, but I think medyo uh, past four na din. And so, I would like to thank you, ma'am, for answering in detail. No? And it would be very helpful for us, faculty members of HEI, and even the administrators of our schools. So, with that, may I call in Dr. Luis D. Perez, the Chief Education Program Specialist of CHED Regional Office 11 for the awarding of e-certificate of recognition to our resource person and for the closing remarks. Good afternoon. So, in behalf of Dr. Luis Perez, so in behalf also of our regional director, Dr. Marekar Arcasquejo, our heart, heartfelt gratitude to the resource person, Dr. Joanne V. Serrano of the University of the Philippines, Open University. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Joanne, for sharing your wisdom, knowledge, and time. So, uh, I would like to read the certificate of recognition for Dr. Serrano. The Republic of the Philippines, Office of the President, Commission on Higher Education, Regional Office 11. This certificate of recognition is hereby awarded to Dr. Joanne V. Serrano for generously sharing her expertise and time as the resource person during the conduct of Ched 11 webinar on instructional design for open and distance e-learning among the administrators and faculty of higher education institutions in Region 11 held on June 3, 2020 via Zoom and Facebook Live. Issued this uh, third day of June, 2020, Davao City, Philippines. Signed, Dr. Maricar Arcasquejo, CISO 3, Director 4. Thank so, uh, <laughs> thank you very much, po, Dr. Joanne. <laughs> thank you, Pa. Thank you for having me. Uh, so, I would uh, like also to... Mm, yes, Pa. Yes, Dr. Ann. Kung meron pong mga uh, very specific questions, sir, pwede naman pong i-forward sa akin and then I can um, address them. Sige po, Dr. Ann. Thank you po. So we would like also to thank our uh, Zoom participants. We have almost 300 uh, registrants no? who have logged into our Zoom. And at the same time, in our Facebook Live. So we have also a uh, lot of participants there at Facebook Live. So thank you very much for attending our webinar number five. So we have learned a lot today about the instructional design for open and distance learning or the ODEL. Thank you again uh, very much, ma'am, Dr. Joan. Thank you, po. Dr. Thank Randy, you. thank you also. Dr. Jenna Carmelo, thank you, po. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Rod. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Salamat. So we have for the evaluation, uh, the evaluation link will be uh, uploaded, will be shared. And reminder, this will just be available for the next two hours after this uh, webinar. Okay, uh, Sir Rod, can you please share the evaluation link? Yes, uh, yes uh, Dr. Gina, I am going to share it now okay. for a while. So reminder to the participants, uh, kindly access the said link within to, uh, for, from now until anong oras na ba ngayon? So four, five, six. So we hope that everyone will be giving their evaluation uh, to this webinar five. So this is the evaluation link, bit.ly slash webinar five. Wait, parang mali ito. Sandali. Okay. This is the evaluation link. 
bit.ly slash evalwebinar5. And you can also scan the QR code for easier access of the link. So either visiting the link directly or you can take a picture of the QR code and then you can directly visit the evaluation. So as mentioned by uh, Dr. Jen Jenna, uh, it will be closed two hours after the web webinar session ended. So only those who have filled out this evaluation will be given an electronic certificate of participation. Okay. So we'll have the photo ops after this. Sige po. Uh, we'll now have the gallery picture. So how do we go about this? Okay, sir? so we will have our thumbs up and then we will have our best smile. <laughs> okay, so one, two, three, thumbs up please, smile. Okay, next we have eight, we have eight galleries. Second, okay, thumbs up please. One, two, three, smile. All right, third. Okay, thumbs up please. One, two, three, smile. Okay, fourth, fourth gallery. So thumbs up please. One, two, three, smile. Thumbs up please. Okay, thank you. Then we have our fifth. One, two, three, smile. Thumbs up. Okay. Next, six gallery. One, two, three, smile. Thumbs up. Okay. Second to the last gallery. One, two, three, smile. Thumbs up, please. Okay. And the last gallery. One, two, three, smile. And that's it. Okay, thank you very much po sa lahat. Dr. Joan, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Randy, thank you po. Dr. Jenna, thank you. Thank you, see you again. See you. Yes po. <laughs>